Station. Coming to you live from the Cross Country Mortgage Campus in Berea, Ohio, this is Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland. Let's focus on the Browns defense, Dante, because it is a good, really good defense. How good is it? Well, they're young, they're aggressive, but they're pretenders. Purdy throws over the middle, it's intercepted! Emerson has it midfield! Emerson at the 40, Niners territory, there's the turnover! Just give him a chance. Uh, Coop did a hell of a job winning on the route, and uh, just give him a chance to go go make a play. Um, and he did, the, he did the rest from there. Um, it was all Coop. Looks that way, fires, Cooper is open, has it at the 40, 45, 50, Amari Cooper makes a move, Niners territory, Amari Cooper to the 25! Today, they're going to get a full look at the best offense in the NFL. So in my book, they're pretenders. Niners at their 20 after the Horcats punt went into the end zone. McLeod motions left to right. Under pressure. Purdy slips out of it. Goes down. Throws the ball at the 10. And they're going to say he's down. That's a sack. Back on the 10. It was JOK. Like I said, they came in there on their high horse, bro. I don't know what it was. They came in there feeling themselves. But you know, they got dealt with. So Snap it in the middle of the field. Between the hashes. 41 yards. For Jake Moody, Wisnowski kneels at the 31 to give the Niners the lead. Snap down. The kick is up. The kick is no good. It's no good. And the Browns will beat the 49ers 19 to 17. He pushed it wide to the right. Here are your hosts, Bo Bishop and Nathan Zagura. Oh, well, let's do it live on a Victory Monday edition of the Pope. Just a cackling at Pedro. Yes. Crying in his wine last night. That was... Um, Too bad. So sad. That was that was something, man. That was for everybody out there who braved... The weather was pretty brutal uh, this weekend here. And to, to brave it, to go down there, um, and to get that... That was for the fans. That was for that defense, which is historically good now. Yes. At, uh, or on a path for being historically good. Um, what Jim Schwartz has meant and brought the attitude that he has brought that defense, the give a damn that that defense has this, this was a nine and a half point line by the time it went off nine, nine and a half. It got a, like and that. it got to 11 at one point, at one point got to 11 and, and to, to handle it that way, to be that dominant physically defensively. Um, that's, that's unbelievable stuff. That's as cool a win as you're going to have. I, I, was, I was thinking about just since I've been here in terms of really fun, cool wins, um, that the fans could experience. Cause remember in 2020, you didn't have that. No, you had none of it. That was, so that was, that yeah. was missing, but it was jets on Thursday night when you broke the streak, that one came to mind. There was a Cincinnati game late in the year, even though we were out of the postseason with Baker in his rookie year where yeah, they were going for the touchdown, when going for the touchdown record like that one. There's, there's some of those out there, but this is way up there. This is the best team in the NFL. You're playing without a litany of stars and to beat them by being tougher, more physical in your own backyard. Sensational. And that's their calling card is physicality. I had a buddy are. who was a, uh, who was a, is a 49er fan who texted me goes, the Browns are one of the few teams in the league that can match the physicality of the Niners. And we did take it to them. I think we were seeing, uh, you know, this was this this was Cleveland, and I think everybody wa- at the game, I felt it. I know everybody else did. Is that we've seen this movie a billion times, and that of course he was going to make that field goal, and it was just going to be a brutal, disappointing yeah. loss. And so when he did not, and you heard the just joy in Andrew Siciliano's voice, who did a great job yesterday, uh, filling in for Jim Donovan and Chris Rose, um, it was such a release, and this is a season changing win oh, and gosh. it is it speaks yeah. to the just the fight in this football team and we'll talk about that literally as well as figuratively and, and this city blue collar right works hard nothing is given everything is earned nobody believes in us Cleveland against the world and this truly was I mean there was nobody believed in this team in this game against the 49ers and despite losing the turnover battle for the fifth straight game yeah. they beat the 49ers and it's incredible I was saying this, I've been going around, it's obviously very happy here in Berea and doing the rounds, lots of hugs and joy and all of that. And I said, if, if I would have told you, knowing that we played all three division games and then out of the division, a Tennessee Titans team that has been a perennial playoff team yep. under Mike Vrabel with Tannehill and Derrick Henry and the 49ers who were a, an undefeated juggernaut. And I said to you, okay, we're going to lose Jack Conklin for the season in week one. Oh, yeah. We're going to lose Nick Chubb for the season in week two. Yep, we are going to play 
two games without Deshaun Watson, and we're going to start three different quarterbacks through our first five games of the season. Joel Batonio is going to miss a game. Mm-hmm. We are going to lose the turnover battle in all five games, including by two or more, I think, in three of them. Mm-hmm. You could be like, we could Ofer. be 0-5. Yeah, yeah, Ofer. And instead, yeah. we're 3-2. and two. We have not played our best football. No. By any stretch of the imagination. Really, if you look at it, you know, you'd say that the Tennessee game was probably our best overall game, offense, defense together. And this team, and but it still wasn't clean. We still turned no, the ball over. Uh-huh. You have a chance now to go forth and be clean and, and start to really kick into gear. And the fact that you won this game sets the table for everything. This game, or if you lose this game, you're two and three. You're hoping to get back to 500. Mm-hmm. Now it's time to go stack wins and get to four and two. But what a gritty, gritty performance. What a great job by this football team. Jim Schwartz is now 9-1 and one against Kyle Shannon. Crazy. Kyle's offenses have never scored more than 20 against him. And 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 by the way, they were gifted seven points in this game. Yeah, That yeah. may as well have been a pick six. They scored on the very first play, eight yards. They didn't have a first down in the field in the second half until the final drive of the game. They did not have a first down. You get credit for a first down when you score a touchdown on sure. an eight-yard play. Yeah, They did not have a first down in the second half until that final drive. You know, you were doing the thing where if, if if this happens, if this happens, we could be 0-5. There isn't anybody, except for maybe the people downstairs in that room, who thought that this defense would be this dominant. Because as much as all of those injuries were unforeseen, we knew this defense had a chance to be good. We knew that Zadarius running with Miles was going to be a problem. Knew Dalvin Tomlinson was going to be really good. But I don't know that anybody, us included, who are as, as big of, of orange and brown colored glasses as you'll find, yeah. thought that you would have this type of dominance. Correct. I mean, this is historical dominance. I saw Jake Trotter with the stat from going back to, to 1970, 1,002 yards given up through five games. Only two teams have given up fewer, and they were both in the 70s. Like, nobody in the, what would be considered for most of our audience since they've been alive has is even aware of any defense that's been played to this level. This is a swaggering, swashbuckling, punch-you-in-the-mouth defense that cannot wait to do it again and again and again. We, we knew that Jim Schwartz was a real deal. First press conference, you knew it, and obviously his history in the league, you oh, yeah. knew it. But what he has brought in conjunction with the talent that Andrew Barry had accom- has, has accumulated, especially realizing after last year this defensive line ain't it. We have got to dramatically improve that front. They believed in their guys in the back seven. They believed in him. Juan Thornhill comes in, obviously, but believed in him. Delpit's been unbelievable. Um, but the combination of the two – is allowing for historical defensive play, and nobody would have foreseen that happening, not to this level. Knew they'd be good, but not historically good this quick. They are historic. You're right. That is fair. And we've been fortunate in terms of the injuries. Really, the only games missed by a starter would have been week one yeah. with Juan Thornhill on the defensive side. Yeah. Of the and, and what a luxury to have Rodney McLeod be the guy who fills in there, sure. who was last year a top five safety at Pro Football Focus. Browns have allowed 52 first downs this year. I know the Browns have played. They've already had their bye. The Cowboys have also only played five games. They're second in the league right now. They're at 81. 81. The Cowboys have also, again, they've only played five, same as F. In total yards, the Browns are at 1,002. The Cowboys are at 1,460. That's second in the league, and they've only played five. So even the Ravens, who have played six, are at 1,565. So the Browns would have to give up 563 yards in the next game just to be tied with them, which feels unlikely with what the Browns are doing of late on defense. Yeah, they are historically good and you think about the fact that the two teams since 1970 that have allowed fewer yards through five games were in 1970 and say what i got a news flash for you it's a different game different league a different sport different sport yeah, different sport the yardage is is come on come on you come by yards no nobody in the 70s threw for 4,000 yards you're mm-hmm. gonna have probably 15 quarterbacks to do that this year if they stay yeah. healthy um it is just a staggering accomplishment and they are doing it by lining up Playing a lot of man, I think they played seventy one percent man against uh, the yeah. Niners in this game, and and got it done. It was it's awesome. I will also say, and we're going to go through break down a ton of stuff, but I want to say this: Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa is becoming a mega star right before our eyes. A mega yeah. star every single week. Multiple tackles for loss. Mm-hmm. Playing behind the line of scrimmage. Missile. becoming a star. For the Browns, and you, that's what you, you, he's he is what he well, was at Notre Dame right now. These are the guys that we talked about. I mean, Delpit's playing to a, a Pro Bowl level. level. You're talking about Delpit, Jeremiah Wusukoromoa. Like these are guys you drafted, um, and and that you hoped would be what 
they've become. Yes. Um, but it is it is also, and this is, while we didn't think the defense would be this dominant necessarily right away, historically so, one thing that we said upon the hire of Jim Schwartz was the switch of this defense, especially the secondary to man principled coverage, yep. was going to benefit tremendously. No doubt. And it has. So that is that is something that is that is stunning. Um, this was... This is this is a crazy different perspective. And if you think about like everything that happens in this week on a week to week basis to to be able to get this win like this to me makes what happened in Pittsburgh now that's a, that's a net. That's a net even. You to needed- take care of that there. Now you're 3 and 2. Yes. Um and now you can approach these games. I mean, Indy, Seattle, Arizona, next 3, 2 out of 3 right there and you can absolutely go to three beat or Seattle five and 3 and you can go th- But but Two out of but three is what one. you ought to do. Of, course, of yeah. course, one at a time. Got to stack them. It's one thing we haven't been able to do is stack them. Stack. Right. But based on what you're doing defensively right now, you're going to be a full day for anybody you play. And this, you are, you you get a, from a scheduling perspective, you and I, I'm not saying those guys down there talk like this, but you and I can. This is a little bit of a break in the schedule and as opposed to what you just came out of. Well, yeah, you got these three that you mentioned. Then it's at Ravens home Steelers. Yeah. And then you get a, a fairly – your final seven are feel pretty good. I mean, we're yeah. now in the – we're through the toughest part of the schedule. And despite all of those things I mentioned in the open, you're three and two. Yeah. Like, it's an unbelievable accomplishment. It's amazing what a difference a foot makes, right? That kick goes in. This oh is a to- totally different show. This is a totally different season. This oh my is God, a tone monstrous, been... monstrous win. And there are no – you don't – beating somebody 100 to nothing – it counts as one win, same as this counts as one win. And this was a great, great win for the Cleveland Browns, for the city, for the fans, for all of it, because now you're getting healthier. Betonio should be back. There is a lot of optimism, and I got a chance to talk with Deshaun Watson myself yesterday at the 50-yard line, uh, that he will be back this week and that things are really kind of ramping up in a positive direction. Well, even here's the deal, though. Like He, can, he doesn't need to be at his best. It'd be nice but he doesn't need to be because how you're playing defensively. I think he agreed, agreed. I think one of the reasons this has gone is and you know has been kind of not the, the odyssey or the saga that it has been made out to be, but is that when it's your throwing shoulder that you want to be fully back mm-hmm. if you're going to go play. And I think that for him this is this is an opportunity to get back. It's again, it's a familiar building. I mean, I don't think no, it's coincidence dome, we indeed. saw his yeah. best game against the Tennessee Titans, a team he's played well against. He's never thrown for fewer than 300 yards in a game in that dome in Indy. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's it all kind of lines up for a very good thing. And, you know, you got to tip your cap to this defense and to Amari Cooper. You know, he kind of put the offense on his back. Oh, I yeah. thought Ford and Kareem Hunt ran the ball incredibly well. We got jobbed by the officials. By the way, let me just – nobody wants to see a game with 25 flags. And that's oh, what no. I think we ended up. No. It was the most in the league this year in terms of flags yeah. and penalty yards. Like, come on, too much, too much. You know, and the, I know the Niners were upset about the the uh, defenseless receiver play, and um, they were they jumped right on it. Blandino was like terrible call, wasn't defenseless, didn't go for the head, not shoulders, hit him on the side. Really, that's yeah, what they said they on went, TV. Yeah, they went at it pretty hard. Um, so I can tell were, you this because that's probably watching it in slow motion. Yeah, you watch that in f- full speed, no question. And we were all just like. Pfft. Yeah, clearly. Yeah, and but they, Gip is a great dude, former yeah, Brown, yeah, yeah, yeah. not dirty in any way. No, and it was probably because the ball was high. Yeah, is why Elijah was <laughs> up higher than he even probably thought he was. But yeah, they were. Um, we'll take it. I, no, for sure. I, I I agree with your point though. Like just way over flagged across the board. They took the a whole touchdown thing. off the board on us yeah. on that play, mm-hmm. and I know people would say on the TV replay, yeah, it looked like Teller was there. Givens just Teller had his arm kind of around him, and Givens just wrench down on it and then turn to make it look like Teller sure. was holding him. It's a screenplay. That guy had no bearing on the play. None. That's what they need to have a little more insight into. That had no bearing at all on the play no. whatsoever. No, none. Um the the play on fourth down for Stefanski to to Kareem Hunt's an all timer. For the touchdown? Yeah. It's an all time call. Like Harrison Bryant's just going to sneak it. You know he's your sneak quarterback. He's a tight end for God's sake. Of course. The notion that somehow you're going to run a toss <laughs> To Kareem. That's what I said. It's a br- stunning call. The it's play brilliant. design's brilliant. So it's think brilliant. about it. Think yeah. about it. By using Harrison Bryan as the sneaker. Yeah. Okay. 
We have now called sneaks with them that have been successful, and we've called two plays off of that that have produced 10 points. One led directly to the only points against the Ravens, yeah. when instead he sneaks it, he tossed it back to DTR, who rolled out and threw a bomb, got a big PI flag. And then this one, where it becomes a toss left, you get an unbelievable kickout block from Jordan Akins, who's in motion. Everybody thinks that's just eye candy, trying to widen us out so we can sneak in the middle. Yeah. And you get a kickout block. I mean, he was untouched. Jed Wills did a great job. David Bell pancaked Fred Warner. And then DPJ, who's a great run blocker. I'd love to see him get the ball a little more, but that's yeah. another story. Did a great job blocking downfield. He walked right in. Genius play design. That was brilliant. And understanding that we've almost created this unique scenario where by putting a tight end under there, which nobody else has really done, that now we have all these wrinkles off of it that now it's even going to be easier for him to sneak it because everybody's got to be worried about all the other things. That was brilliant. It really like, was. The design of that. Very cool. That's, I can't wait to ask him about that because I don't even know if that question can – I want it. And he loved – that's what Coach Stefanski likes. Like, the ex, like that, yeah. all right, how did we come up with this? Right. Walk me through the, the origin of, hey, well, maybe we could run a yeah. toss with a, a, lead, a pulling lead blocker. <laughs> it's amazing. One of the things that was from the television perspective of it, um, one of the things that I found a little bit annoying, and I'm not one to be – I don't think that Ohio is against the world. I don't think the world's against Ohio. I don't really buy much of that. Um, but I did notice in the television call of the game, the there was a constant uh, reminder of who was out for the 49ers. Yeah. Like it was – we were constantly being reminded that Debo Samuel and McCaffrey weren't playing. And I'm thinking to myself, like – are you doing the same on – they weren't. It wasn't. Like, it wasn't like there is no Nick Chubb. There is no Jack Conklin. There is no Deshaun Watson. Like, they mentioned Watson Batonio. obviously a few times. Batonio. No mention. But uh, it, we were constantly reminded of Debo, McCaffrey, Brock Purdy doesn't know how to operate without these guys. I'm going like, we got P.J. Walker, third quarterback in five games. Yeah. You think we had – Kareem Hunt wasn't even on – he wasn't on an NFL team when this season started for right. God's sakes. Like, what are we talking about? We're it was without, so okay. strange. It was very strange. Five-time Pro Bowler and multiple-time All-Pro yeah. left guard. Two-time first-team All-Pro right tackle. Your three-time Pro Bowler quarterback who had led the league in passing a few years yeah. ago. Four straight Pro Bowls at your running back position. And by the way, McCaffrey played most of the game. I mean, sure he played, he did. Uh, and by the way, it's not like he went out. He went out because he got bludgened. Yes. He was beat up at halftime. Because we are physical. He was bloodied all over his elbow. Look at this guy. We got, we got oh, one of the stars of the game go. coming in right now. I will say this, though. Upon further review, I think Debo Samuel hurt his shoulder in the pregame fracas when he came and gave that big shove. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was even running after that kind of with his arm down. And I noticed it on one of the plays he went in motion. I'm like, he's, he's not moving his arm. And then that was it for him. Greg Newsom That'd be good in karma. studio coming up next on a Victory Monday edition. We're off and running Cleveland Browns Daily, 850 ESPN Cleveland.
The Cleveland Browns, Avocados from Peru and Meyer want you to enter the ultimate football sweepstakes, your chance to win a 2023 Ford Lightning electric pickup truck, a VIP tour of the Cross Country Mortgage Campus, or $1,000 Meyer gift card. Today is the last day to register. Visit your local Meyer or clevelandbrowns.com slash avocados for more. Joined in studio by one of the stars of this game yesterday that we've spent so much time talking about, Greg Newsom in studio. Um, that had that is a That was a heavy weight fight man like as a defensive player to be involved in one like that what was it like man like you said a fight um battling every single snap every single down man I told you after the game I'm just the most sore I've been after a game but it was super fun for it to come down to you know us being on the field um and trying to close it out for the team and you being a nickel going against a Kyle Shanahan team that has motion yeah. Every play, we played a lot of men. That may have been, if you had, a, I don't know if you geo tracked it, but that may have been the most miles you've <laughs> run in a game because you were constantly running across the formations. It felt like almost every play. Yeah, that we we said I think they motion on 81, 90 percent of their snaps. So I was running back and forth, <laughs> guarding people. That was easily the most I've ran in a game. For sure. <laughs> you know, it's it's this was something that's been building though too. I mean. Nathan and I, even at mini camp, and then certainly in training camp, there was a swagger that was coming with this defense. Um, but it's it's one thing to talk about it, but then it's another thing to actually put it out on the field and do it. This was obviously the biggest test. This was the best offense in football in terms of their efficiency. Um, where where did the to, where does that swagger first start building from? When did you guys realize it would be special, and why did you have the confidence that you had yesterday going into the game? Yeah, um, first, when we realized, um, I think it was just when we acquired all the pieces we got, when, you know. We had a great core of defenders, I would say, before the season. Um, and then, you know, when you get guys like Dalvin and Obo and Zadarius and bring a guy in like Juan and Rod, like we had so much depth. So we knew on paper that it was amazing. Um, and then, you know, we obviously start playing with each other more at practice. You know, during training camp, we like, we could be special. And then the first preseason game, when I didn't play and I seen, I was like, "Man, we're gonna we're gonna be special." So that was probably the first the first time that we we really realized. And you know, going into this game, coach told us he was like, "Corners, get your man shoes on. That's what we're gonna be playing all game." So we already knew what type of game it was, and we knew the D line. You know, us playing man helps them so much, um, and them being able to rush helps us so much. So they don't have to think too much. Everybody got a man and. We could just play, so we we knew the outcome would be in our favor uh, because man to man is like was what we love to do. Hey, you guys are doing things that are quite frankly that are historic, and in the context yeah. of the only teams that have allowed fewer yards through five games played in 1970 and 71, when the NFL was I don't know slightly different 50, <laughs> 52, 53 years ago in terms of the way that passing operated and all of that, it's it's just remarkable. Now I want to go back before the game because. You guys have all this swagger. The Niners are a team with a ton of swagger, and why not? They haven't lost a regular season game in 15 until they lost to us yesterday. What happened in that kind of pregame fracas and and the way that you guys responded to it, I thought kind of set a tone. Even though they started off 10-0, I think it still set a tone for that game. Yeah, nah, for sure. I mean, it really just started. I was out there doing some, you know, DB drills, you know, pregame and – you know, Ayuk and Debo come dancing, like, in front of me. I'm like, all right, here we go. We already know. So I go back in and tell the guys in the locker room, everybody's fired up, ready to go. Uh, then they just kind of ran through our DB drills, knocked the ball down in there. And then after that, we were, I know, we were just ready to go. Um, and like you said, I, I think it did set the tone for it. Um, we're a group that already brings a lot of energy. Uh, so, so we are definitely just ready for that for sure. And so they they try to bully people. They play a style, even though it's a very pretty style. It, it's a style of bully ball, and their wide receivers are certainly involved in. I saw you were involved with Juwan Jennings on on multiple occasions there. And your mental, what was kind of your mentality in terms of these guys are going to try to come take to us, but we're going to go take it to them. Yeah, for sure. It's just hit them first. Um, that's what uh, you know. Coach Lynch has been saying the whole. It's going to be a heavyweight. I mean, they're going to throw shots. They're going to connect. We're going to throw shots. We're going to connect. So. Um, that was kind of our mindset going into that game. It was like, it's going to be a physical game. We already knew that, so we were prepared. What did they say after the game to you? Uh, they didn't really – honestly, the receivers were cool about it. They were like, man, you guys, like, <laughs> we earned it. You know, I didn't really – I don't really honestly don't talk to receivers after the game anyways Yeah, too much, so I didn't really get to talk to them. But you don't want to be friends with these guys. Yeah, you want to yeah, lock them down. Just talk to Trent, um, just, you know, just saying great player and everything, but I don't really talk to receivers yeah. too much after the game. You mentioned uh, Coach Schwartz on the – 
get your deep, get your man shoes ready to. It feels like he has brought something to this in terms of an attitude, and whether it's something like that, playing a team like them and say, hey, man on man, our men are better than their men. Um, what, what about his style fits with this talent? Um, his style is attack, attack mindset, where, you know, we have the best D-line in the league. You know, they love attacking, and then, you know, we got the best secondary in the league as well to cover man to man. And, you know, you got linebackers like JLK and Walk and Sione just flowing everywhere. I feel like at every level, you know, we're we're an attack, you know, attack defense. So I feel like with him is just he allows us to be ourselves. You know, obviously we're playing a great offense and you know the 49ers and a lot of teams sit back because they have so many motions. So they try to sit back in zone so they can yeah. you know push it, but he's like no, we're going to continue to do what we do. It's play man coverage. Uh you know, DBs, you guys are going to be stressed this game. You guys are going to have to win. So um I just like that he gives us that confidence to like let us know like we need you guys yeah. in order to win this game. How much do you like when you get teams in, in obvious passing situations, we'll call it, knowing that you're going to get the pressure, the ball's got to come out, but that you guys are able to get. And there he is. Thumbs, thumbs up. up. There we go. All right, we like thumbs Biggest up develop. there. Yeah, Biggest exactly. Developed. There, there it is. Yeah, that is as, that's as big as a luminary gets in this building. There. <laughs> that's the top of the food chain. Um, when you guys go to that dime where you've got the three corners, you bring Rodney in, you got now three safeties, JOK, who's been playing phenomenal from your draft class as well, you two guys lighten it up there. What does that do in terms of the flexibility for you guys? There he is. Yes. Swag's fired up. The flexibility, and even on some of those motions, I noticed when you were in the dime, you could pass as opposed to having to run. You were able to kind of kick him over to Rodney. Yeah. I mean, it's – I love when the DBs, man. I'm biased, but I love having all the guys on the field. I mean, when we get in obvious passing situations, we know it. Now it's time for that engine to, to go heat up the quarterback. Yep. Um, we always preach to them guys, you know, we got to stop the run early and make them pass, so, you know, and let the D-line eat. So when we get to those third and longs, it's time to play tight coverage because we know the ball has to come out quick. It does seem with you guys, and obviously the – We've been through a lot offensively from an injury standpoint in terms of the guys who aren't here. It what one one thing that we talk about a lot. It does feel like you guys are like, we got this. You, you'll, you're going to get rolling. Deshaun will get healthy and, and everything will get rolling. But we, you can lean on us. Is there a sense of that on your side of the ball? For sure, we tell we tell them all the time. You know, after you know any turnover, before any play, before they go out there, like just we got you guys. Like no matter what, you'll have the ball back. We even told PJ that before, like, you'll get another chance. Don't worry about it. Um, and, and I just think that's that complimentary football because at the end of the day, you know, it's going to be a game where we need those guys and they're yeah. going to pick us up. That's just how football is played. So we're definitely trying to, you know, be that for the offense. And, you know, when they get clicking all the way full, full throttle, we'll be ready. You guys did not allow a first down in the field in the second half until that last possession. Crazy. They get credit for a first down on the short field, yada, yada. You didn't allow first down. There were three of 12. This was a juggernaut. And I want to go back to one play that happened in the first half. I believe it was in the first half. Zadarius so comes. We run a twist. He comes through. It was a ball that went to Ayuk down the field, and, and Denzel was right there, and they weren't able to connect. After Zadarius hit him on that, and by the way, I think he carried him about five yards in the air. It was like a Goldberg spear. Purdy was not the same, and it felt like he was kind of throwing off his back foot, turning as he was throwing. His accuracy went out the window, basically. Yeah. Did you guys sense that that play and kind of that hit was a tone setter and kind of changed how they were going to be operating? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, it starts off by stopping that run. You know, you stop the run and make him pass. Now he has to sit in that pocket. And, you know, we, we kind of see stuff every game. He loves sitting in the pocket and throwing and up. Standing, right. You got that D-line there, you know, playing us, you're not going to be able to do that. So, um, and no quarterback wants to get hit. We kind of, like, think about him – the same in completion percentage-wise and accuracy as like a Joe Burrow where, you know, they like to sit in that pocket, get the ball out quick. Yeah. And, you know, when you're playing a D-line like us, it's hard to do. So when you start feeling pressure, you don't want to get hit all game. So he, his, his accuracy definitely went down when, when, you know, when you see those guys coming for you. Greg, how important is it now uh, – this is a pretty sweet victory Monday. Get to 3-2. and two, uh, You get the Colts this week. How important is it and, and how much have you guys talked even today and, and even following the game yesterday of let's stack them? Yep. Let's let's run a couple of these off because it's it's there. The talent's there to be able to do it. And is that something that is discussed in the building? For sure. I mean, as soon as we won that game, obviously we celebrated with each other, but we, we all said it's on the next week. Um, and, you know, every opponent that we play 
is going to give, you know, give it their all, and anything can happen on any given Sunday. So our goal this week is to go 1-0. and That's exactly what we do. And that starts every single day. Go 1-0 on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yeah. Saturday, and then obviously going 1-0 on Sunday. So that's definitely our mindset is to start stacking these wins. You know, we can't win one and lose one. we got to, you know, remain consistent. Yeah. This is a big one. All right. We're going to get into something that has been much ballyhooed, bandied about. You and MJ Emerson, your little competition. He finally <laughs> got the pick. What happened? What happened? What's the, what, what was the, what's the net net? Nah, man. I, he, he, got, he got me first. <laughs> you know, I, thought, I thought I was going to give me one, too. I know. Uh, it was close on that. It was game. close. Yeah. It was close. And but, just for people, though, they know that that ball, he actually, the receiver hit the ball, so it never you. got to like, your hands. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, but, nah, man, super proud of him. Uh, he's been playing amazing uh, for us. And I think, honestly, we got the three best guys in the league on yeah. one team, which is which is scary. Um, and, and just the way we play, I mean, we're able to sub. Like, I, I feel like we're starting something. Like, you'll see on the field – me and MJ on base, yep. and Ward coming in a nickel, and you'll see MJ and Ward out there, and I'm coming in on nickel. So you can't really get a tell who you're going to be going against, which is hard for fresh. receivers. It's interchangeable. Keep us fresh. Like yeah. I think, you know, I think that's amazing for us. So you know, the emergence of him into a year two, because it's, it's obviously good to do a year one, but you know, to to do it again year two, and for him to take that step to be an elite elite, um, is is definitely great to see. And you guys love each other. Like, that's what I love. This defense, you can oh, tell. Oh, it's tight-knit. Oh, man. The celebrations are great oh. for big – like, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it just – how fun was that celebration, by the way, after the pick? Oh, man, it's amazing, man. I mean, I didn't even celebrate with him. I was just starting doing – me and Grant jumped up with the crowd. <laughs> man, it, it's just amazing. Like, you could kind of – you could tell, like, we're a brotherhood. Yeah, yeah. And we, we all want each other to make plays. Do you think the time at the Greenbrier helped in that regard? For sure. Um, I always say my closest teams have always been at Northwestern in my whole entire life. And we used to go to Wisconsin for training camp. We never stayed at Northwestern uh, at Camp Kenosha, and that's where we got time to just be with each other. No family, no – obviously family can come, like, to practices, but you're only with that team. So I, I definitely think that time out there helped us, you know, become a whole. That's been fun to watch so far. Keep it going, man. Congratulations yes, on a big you. win on Sunday. Great pleasure to have you on. Sure. Greg Deuce of joining us here in studio. Browns fans, visit your local Tide Cleaners anytime during the month of October for a chance to win tickets for an upcoming Browns home game. You'll be automatically entered to win with any purchase. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Bet. Sports betting partner, your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
And Pet Supplies Plus give you the chance to win tickets to home games all season long while providing the best deals for your pet at over 75-plus stores in Ohio. Enter to win tickets at clevelandbrowns.com slash Pet Supplies Plus and receive a coupon to use at your local Pet Supplies Plus with your entry. Pet Supplies Plus, proud partner of your Cleveland Browns. And now the podium and Kevin Stefanski. All right, injury front. Uh, Desha- You're down. His rehab, he's making progress. He's day-to-day, and we'll know more as the week progresses. Uh, Joel Batonio coming off that knee. Uh, continues to get better. Uh, hopefully we'll see him out of practice uh, Wednesday. Said Tillman, I think, will be good to go. Uh, Anthony Walker's in the concussion protocol, and then Michael Dunn has a calf injury. Um, like we talked about yesterday, you know, really hard-fought, uh, gutty win, uh, proud of the effort from the players, really proud of the, the game plan put together by the coaches. Um, so it was it was really a good outing uh, for a bunch of people, and, and it wasn't perfect, it wasn't pretty, but I think you just saw a, a team battling, and that's what you have to do against a really good opponent. And I mentioned yesterday, I thought our fans were, you know, incredible uh, fr- from the jump right there with us, uh, yeah, and stuck it out there uh, through the end. So very appreciative of our fans as well. Uh, but with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, coach, um, you know, going back to yesterday's game, and and just uh, you know from pregame all the way through the end, the, the fight that you guys showed um, just, you know, where has that mentality come from this year? It just, it, it feels like there's a different vibe around this particular group of guys. Yeah. As you know, I'm not into vibes. Uh, I'm into, into that, into the people on this team. Uh, I'm into the people on our staff and, and, you know, how hard this team works. That, that's really what we focus on. We knew, the type of game it was going to be, Daryl, uh, just with the challenge that the Niners presented from a schematic standpoint, from a, a talent standpoint. So I think that was really what we talked about all week was embracing that uh, challenge and embracing the opportunity we, we had in front of us. And with the depleted offensive line yesterday, uh, the success that Jerome and Kareem and that run game had, just after you went back and, and, and watched that on film, uh, what did you see from those guys and why were they – uh, able to uh, be a little more successful than maybe they were in, in weeks past. Yeah, it's always a combination of things. That, as, as you can imagine, it's a, a really good plan. I thought the coaches put together a really good plan. And then the execution was on point. But that, you, you mentioned the offensive line. They'll get in trouble if I single anybody out. But uh, they did a really, really good job uh, with, with a tough front. I mean, that's a very good run front. Uh, and, and we got on the edges when we could get on the edges. We ran – tight zone when we could run tight zone we, we moved them with double teams so tried tried a little bit of everything uh, and then you got to highlight the tight ends and the wide receivers the, the the role they play in the run game as well but Kareem ran hard uh, Jerome ran hard it wasn't pretty always uh, but man they, they played really hard hey Kevin I was wondering about that fourth and short decision in the fourth quarter um, what went into it, it looked like you're going to go for it and then change your mind yeah, they changed the spot on us. Uh, it, it was fourth and in inches, I think, and then it became fourth and one uh, and just felt like the way our defense was playing. Uh, you know, let's play the field position game there. Gotcha. And then Amari said after the game that not a lot of people know he can go up and make the kind of leap and catch he did on the sideline. Um, did you know it had he, he had that in him? And what kind of view did you have of that? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, that was a big part of that game plan going in Scott was we knew we were going to get one-on-one matchups with our guys and, and I thought PJ did a great job of giving him a chance giving him a ball and then Amari did what Amari does and you have to do that versus their corners versus that uh, that type of attack when they're playing tight man you have to go elevate and win a contested ball and not get you know knocked out of bounds or knocked down you gotta, you gotta go up and get it and I thought uh, he did that but yeah he, he's more than capable of going to get the football. Kevin, we talk about the edge rushers all the time, um, but in that interior, you guys brought in Dalvin Tomlinson, obviously, for a reason, but you have Jordan Elliott out there making plays as well. How have you seen maybe Jordan grow with Dalvin and the two of them step up on that interior defensive line? Cam, I thought Dalvin was outstanding in that football game versus the run, versus the pass, disruptive, uh, getting after the quarterback, getting through the offensive line, so... Uh, I thought he played outstanding. Jordan continues to to grow as a player. Uh, I think he fits this scheme. He's attacking blocks. So, uh, the, you know, there was a bunch of guys that you can single out, but but those two in particular did play really well. And in that front, you know, the guys, the coverage too, just seems to continue to be really strong. 
how have you seen that progress as this season has gone on, dropping back with the linebackers and even the safeties and corners? Well, I think every game plan can be different week to week and what we're trying to take away. And and sometimes you add pressure uh, via the, the front seven. Sometimes you you put a little bit more on our defensive backs and, and secondary. And I thought the secondary for the amount of man that we played and how hard they fought uh, throughout the entire game versus some really good receivers, some good scheme. Uh, I thought the guys were flying around. It was not perfect. You know, we knew that there was going to be times where you're going to be chasing your guy. He's going to have a step on you. But uh, just with the secondary working in conjunction with each other, communicating with each other, uh, they had a tall task in that game, and I thought they did a really nice job. Hey, Coach, I know you like to look forward, but just have to look back a little historical. Can you just talk about, you know, that's – NFL record setting first five games for the defense. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really unheard of. Yeah, obviously Jeff, you look at some of the, or Fred, sorry, you look at some of the stats and, and uh, they're, you know, we're, we're playing good defense. We're playing sound defense, but there's, there's room for improvement. And I think that's, uh, those are some of the things that we talked about this morning. Uh, th- there are definitely things that we can continue to do better. Uh, I know Coach Schwartz and the defensive staff uh, are not concerned at all about statistics. We're not. It's just not how we operate. Uh, we're concerned with playing good football, playing sound defense, uh, and we're not chasing in any type of stats. Yeah, Kevin, I want to ask you about the Harrison Bryant uh, short yardage package without giving away any, you know, state secrets here, but just, you know, what inspired that? What gave you the idea that Harrison would, uh, you know, fit so well doing that for you and just the wrinkle you were able to throw in yesterday with that pitch back to Kareem and it ended up in a touchdown. Yeah. You know, those meetings uh, for short yardage, uh, short yardage goal line. Those are, those are some of my favorite ones during the week because you try to look at what you might be facing and try and get creative and get that yard sometimes. And and then there are also opportunities uh, at times for explosives. Uh, We've run that play before. uh, So that's no secret. But to have a versatile football player like Harrison that you trust in those moments uh, to do a variety of of jobs. Uh, You know, he's a guy since he got here, he does a lot of dirty work, doesn't get a lot of the credit, but he's done a really nice job in that expanded role. Hey, Kevin, I'm back at 30. Okay, after the game, but just where have you seen him make kind of the biggest strides from his first two years? Well, you know, I, I would point out, first of all, his play on the opening kickoff was outstanding. He, he came down, he really set the tone, I think, for the entire day uh, with, with how hard he played and, and how physical and violent he plays. Uh, he, he's doing a nice job. I think he's playing really fast. I think he's also playing really strong. I think he's working really hard to, to be a uh, – physical strong football player and i think that's what you see on sundays you're up all right there's coach stefanski at the podium uh here's some additional numbers from the win over the 49ers first double digit comeback win for kevin stefanski first double digit comeback win since 18 that's the jets game the bud light uh open the fridge game um in that one 19 and 10 under coach stefanski overall our defense has allowed just we mentioned this a thousand and two yards this season third fewest through the first five games since the 1970 merger and the two teams that are better than that were both from the 70s where the game was played at a very what is it like the colts and the lions or something like that from way back then i couldn't even tell you who were on those teams um me neither. A couple we weren't of even other, born. No, we were not. We're old, but not that old. More on the Browns' defense. First downs allowed this season. Cleveland is number one in the league, 52. Next best, Dallas, 81, and they play tonight. Right, so that's the, way, the same number of games, actually, for Same them. number of games for them, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. so that is the same number of games for them. Uh, Tampa Bay is at 94, and they are third in that. But of course, And same number of buy. games for them because they had oh, a bye. Oh, yeah, they had a bye. They had a bye. Yeah, yeah they did. Third down percentage, uh, completion percentage, conversion percentage, rather, we are number one in the league, 23%. Good Lord, that's crazy. Just for perspective, and you think about how, I mean, the Buckeyes have played largely nobody. Yep. Their third down defense um, was 60th. Oh, no, no, that wasn't the number. It was, but it was, it was way up, like 60th. Like the idea that 23% of your third downs converted it's in crazy. the NFL is is absolutely nuts. Second on the team in sacks after Miles, Obo Okoronkwo. He's got three and a half on the season um, on this one. This is from Jake Trotter, friend of the program. After finding out he would start against the 49ers, PJ Walker called Jacoby Brissett, who gave him one piece of advice. If Amari Cooper beats his man off the line of scrimmage, throw it down. The ball which it worked is, well, which is pretty good. Uh, Coop said, "I knew our connection would be good when PJ talked uh, talked me that." Hopkins, Dustin Hopkins, our kicker, who's just spectacular. Um, 
uh, at least 50 yards in four consecutive games, the old record three by the dog pound captain, Phil Dawson, who was there yesterday. And I said how pro, what did I, I think I said something that was his fourth field goal was from 50 mm-hmm. in the game with number four in the house because Phil yeah. Dawson was there. Yeah, and it apropos. was apropos. Yeah, it was apropos that it was that the last kick was missed as well that in in Phil's presence. So that was this was special. This was a a monumental win for the franchise. It changes the way you feel entirely yeah, um, about changing. this team, and it it allows for now you to be able to stack it a little bit. But there's there's some historical stuff that's happening with this defense, and I think one of the things that you're seeing with the, with an exception to Miami, who's just on a, an entirely different level, and San Francisco until they they had played us, you are not seeing these wide open offenses. And I don't know if defensive is, have adjusted or if it's just sluggish out of the starts, but consistency offensively is not happening in the league. It's not happening in Kansas City. It's not happening in Buffalo. Um, it was happening in San Francisco. It was absolutely happening in Miami. But few other places around the league do you see consistent great offenses. And so this defense is one that you can ride for a while. It most certainly most certainly is. I know we get the note uh, about Obo Karanquo in here that he's at three and a half sacks, second on the team. They took they they took a sack away after the game. Oh, did they really? They took it away. Why? They turned it into a team sack because it was one of those ones where Purdy kind of like ran up and slid, and then the first person that touched him always gets a sack, and they called it a team sack. Ridiculous. Hmm. That would have been his ninth sack in the last twelve games. He deserved that sack. I'm not happy about that. So we ended up with three sacks yesterday, one for uh, JOK, one for Sione Taki Taki. And then one that is listed as a team sack on the official manifest. And that wasn't over. We will both take that. Thank you very much. All three of you will. Yes, we will. Yeah. P.J. Walker completion percentage. Pedro went over. It was 65.5. Yes. Uh, Pedro and Gibbe went over. You went under. That's right. Uh, McCaffrey, 125 total yards under across the board. Winners. Winner, winners, chicken dinners. Um, Brown's team rushing yards, 80.5. You and Gibbe went over. Winner. Pedro went under. Ooh, you could have a 5-0 and week, kid. Uh, and the actual over-under was 37 and a half. You went over? Yeah, 36. Sad, 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 sad. So you went 4-1. and one. So did Pedro Gibe. and Gibe, Gibe went 4-1. and one. <sighs> Still down Pedro a game. Pedro went 3-2. Still down a game to the great Gibe. Yeah, yeah. Like there are a lot of – this is this is a fun one, and to really kind of break down and get into the minutia of this one I think is going to be very, very fun as well because there's so much, so many individual performances that were outstanding for the Cleveland Browns. It was awesome. There was, I mean, I'll be very candid with you. This, the odds of winning this game were snowball in hell, is, is the way it felt to me coming into it. I mean, it just not many, were, were, yeah, not, not yeah, much, there, not much. It was th- this was such a comprehensive offensive attack from San Francisco that came in here, and you just didn't know what we would be able to do offensively to score enough points. And you you get one off of your creativity on the play with Kareem that scored. Um, I was even, as good as our defense has been. I didn't know that it had that in it. With against them, no, it's I, a I tough. And, and to be fair, I think losing Debo took a lot, a few things out of their playbook. Ray Ray McLeod, they still were able to get some of those jet sweeps, but yeah. it's not some of the same things that they're able to do with Debo. I thought we did a great job, obviously taking Kittle away from their game plan. I don't know if I think what maybe he had one catch in the game, if that Kittle finished with one catch for one yard. I mean, the guy was just coming off a game where he had three touchdowns. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was an unbelievable performance, and our defense is phenomenal. And I do think. If everything is all things being equal, I'm big on the dome. I think that the fact there was no dome yesterday was very helpful to us because Brock Purdy, it, it felt like at times, had a tough time with the wet ball. By the way, the luck of when a ball has been on the ground for the Cleveland Browns, and we're, yet we're still 3-2, has been unbelievable. The lack of luck. Yes, the yeah, bad luck. Bad luck when the ball is on the ground. Yeah. It slips out of his hands. We have two guys within six inches of him at the time the ball slips out of his hands, and it, it just goes right where he falls on it. Think about the ball, the way the one on bounce like a bounce pass from Highsmith to T.J. Watt. Mm-hmm. We get Tannehill, and it bounces like it was a pass all the way over to Derrick Henry. Like, one of these days, th- that stuff's going to even out. We keep putting the ball on the ground. It's going to even out. What was what were the conditions like? Raining on and off, wet, cold, windy. Yeah. So somebody does a – some analytics site assessed Jake Moody's final field goal and said that he hit it right on center. The spin on the ball would have caused it to move a few degrees off of center, but still well through, but the wind pushed it 2.69 yards to the right or something like that, and that's what caused him to – so enough to do that. Enough to do that. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it was was a brutal weekend. 
across the board. Saturday yeah, not was pleasant. god awful. We were closing out the youth football on Saturday, and it was absolutely dreadful. Saturday night we played at seven thirty in that garbage. It was awful, just brutal. So put a dome over the whole damn region, as far as I'm concerned. Fine. And I think as long here's the other thing. Sure, it helps you yesterday, but long term, of course, you've got the quarterback. Like you, you get to, the talent. To lose yes. those, t- if you have the most talent, you want the the conditions to be Ideal. absolutely pristine. Yeah. Um, perfect. Perfect. And, conditions. and so, so that's, that's the situation on that. This was a very, very fun win. Uh, it checked every single box. It was something so, so needed for the fan base. It was something so neat. It was good to see the defense rewarded by its effort. I mean, my God, you're talking about IUC had four for 76, the next highest, like total yardage guy on them. McCarthy McCaffrey had 52 yards of yep. total offense in this yep. game. Yep. That's it. Purdy That's nuts. was Purdy completing three. 73% of his passes. And, and by the way, for all the people out there that wonder what, if they think Brock Purdy is good, did you hear what he said? Yeah. He would, we they treat him like, like Joe Burrow. Burrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty high praise, I would imagine. Um, he was 12 of 27. And he started off, I want to say, at one point in the game, he was 5 of 7. And then I think Zadarius hit him. And if that if that is true, and I believe that it is, that means he was 7 for his last 20. Yeah. Yeah, and then the crazy thing is, is it almost feels like it's all going to come out from under you because you get the final drive and you're like, oh God, really? Yes. Really? You're yes. going to do this? This is how this is going to go? Yes. Uh, we will have the Joe Thomas half hour of the program. That is going to be coming up next. Before I do that, though, celebrities uh, celebrate Sunday's win over the Niners, the Browns radio network team. Thursday, 7 to 8, Kevin Stefanski shows live from Slim and Chubby's in Strongsville. Elijah Moore joins Z and Gerard on site signing autographs brought to you by Bud Light. Easy to Sunday, easy to enjoy. The Hoff coming up next. Cleveland Brazil, 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Cleveland Browns, avocados from Peru and Meyer want you to enter the ultimate football sweepstakes for your chance to win a 2023 Ford Lightning electric truck. VIP tour of the Cross Country Mortgage Campus or a $1,000 Meyer gift card. Today is the last day to register. Visit your local Meyer or clevelandbrowns.com slash avocados for more information on that. And with that, it is time to bring on the gold jacket himself, the Hoff, for the Joe Thomas half hour of the program. Uh, all right, be honest with me. Leading up to kickoff, your your percentage chance on a Browns win was what? I, I was Fair. feeling that this was potentially going to be one of those weekends where there was going to be a lot of upsets because we just really haven't seen that weekend yet. No. And so maybe that was just the optimist in me trying to create a case in my head for why I want to watch and get excited and not be disappointed and let down. But just not having your quarterback there and with P.J. Walker only being there for a little while, I just didn't – I wasn't giving myself a lot of outcomes that could potentially lead to victory when you can't run the ball and they got a really good offense and they can control the football. Like I just didn't see a path to victory, but I'm glad I was wrong. I'm glad you were wrong too, Hoff, because this is pure joy. <laughs> a pure huge, joy. a huge, huge pure. win for, for the Browns. What stood out to you about this game and this defense in particular that really was the catalyst for the Browns being able to get this win? Uh, the swarming nature of the defense. It reminded me of the Jim Schwartz defense that I played against many times during my career, Tennessee, Detroit, Philadelphia, where it just felt like we couldn't do anything all day long. No matter what we did, they had dudes in the backfield that were disrupting the flow of our offense. And that's what it looked like the 49ers. As many times as they tried to get something going, like they just had nowhere to run. And then when they tried to drop back and pass, it was like every blitz was just perfectly timed. It was perfectly executed. For an offense that prides itself on getting a hat on a hat, we had free runners all day off the edge. I just thought it was such a masterful game plan, and it gave me nightmares to going against Jim Schwartz back when I was playing. Yeah, Hoff, this is uh, historic stuff this defense is doing. Just 1,002 yards uh, through five games. That's third fewest since 1970. And the two that are better than it were both in the 70s. And so that's when the game was played very, very differently. What – if you were to try to attack this defense, how would you do it? What type of team could have success? Because we were talking, we had Greg Newsom in here in the first hour of the program, and he talked about how good we were on every level. Every level. And it does feel like, like that there is. I mean, there's really no holes on this group. Yeah, you're giving me a, a really challenging question here. This <laughs> is worse than the SATs. Like, what does number one mean to you? They're first in – Yards per game, they're first in pass yards, they're first in completion percentage allowed, they're first in third down percentage. I mean, you look at that and you say, all right, maybe you could try to run the ball a little bit. Nope. But I think one of the stories that really hasn't been told enough is the impact that Dalvin Tomlinson has had on this team. Um, I, I think he's a guy that gets overlooked because he maybe doesn't have uh, the stats that, you know, Miles Garrett or some of these other guys have. But um, the way he's clogging things up in the middle, the way he is disrupting running concepts, running schemes, getting free, knocking pullers off, allowing those linebackers to run. I mean, I, there's really nowhere you can run against these guys. And I think once the 49ers lost a couple of their studs on the outside and it looked like it wasn't Brock Purdy's day, it was like, okay, the only way they're going to get back in this is run the football. And then even still, they, they really weren't able to do much of anything trying to run the ball. No, you really kind of shut them down. McCaffrey, 3.9 yards to carry. Coming into the game, the Browns were giving up just 3.2 yards to carry on the ground, and, and they had another strong performance there. You're right. Dalvin Tomlinson is one of those guys that if you go based on stats alone, you'd say, ah, okay. But you, when you put the tape on, he has been sensational, and his ability to really push the pocket and really collapse the line of scrimmage I think has been so useful for this Browns D and useful for a guy I want to ask you about now, have Jeremiah Wusu Koromo, who is knifing in, playing in the opponent's backfield, and I think is finally is looking like that superstar we thought we were getting uh, out of Notre Dame that we saw, I think, real glimpses of in his first year in the league. Yeah. Yeah, he was awesome. I mean, it's so fun watching him get sacks, make solo tackles, go sideline to sideline. Um, and, and I think a lot of it is the way that the, the front muddies up the blocking schemes in front. So it's rare that he has offensive linemen with a straight shot at him. So it allows him to use his brain, to use his reactions, and to use his speed to be able to find the football. Um, and I think Jim Schwartz has always done a great job of allowing those guys to 
reduce the number of things that they're thinking about in their head so they can just go out and allow their natural play speed to shine. Certainly so. We're going to uh, get uh, reconnect with Joe. Obviously, a lot of static in the connection, so we'll we'll reconnect with Joe real quickly here. Um, we the the defensive front speaks for itself. Um, the the corners speak for themselves. You mentioned JOK a couple of times. Delpit to me is right there in that conversation. Thornhill, there's a lot, uh, but but those two guys who were drafted, elevating now is a big part of this too. It's it's all of all of the pieces matter. It's huge. Yeah. And you think about the fact that look at some of the draft picks in recent years. You mentioned Craig Newsom, Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa. Alex Wright is starting to play really good football for this team and give them as the fourth defensive end and a rotational piece in Jim Schwartz's defense. That has been obviously All right, very we got big Joe. as well. Um, but yet those draft picks are, and MJ Emerson's a draft pick. I mean, yeah. Yeah, That's they're all really starting to go. Three of them, obviously, more so than others. Speaking of draft picks, I believe we have our first overall draft yeah. pick in the Cleveland Browns Daily Draft. Uh, the Great Hoff is back. Um, I wanted to ask you about another draft pick. Big Thanos at right tackle. What a transition. I was do the same. Beautiful. Pretty remarkable stuff, Hoff. Uh, one pressure allowed. Bosa didn't get any off him, though, right, Z? Not one off of Bosa. Off no. of going up against Big Thanos. Uh, Dewan Jones, this early in his career, this good? Who had that? Nobody. <laughs> I mean, he's right? been unbelievable. By the way, we need an on air light. I think that's why my connection was. That's it. You're right. You're exactly. Right. Uh, you but anyways, that? we digress. I want to talk about that because he really has been amazing um, to do what he's done against the quality of opponent that he's seen here in his you know first few games of his NFL career is remarkable. And the, the conversation that we've been having a little bit was like, yeah, the pass blocking has been really good. Run blocking needs to improve. I thought he probably had his best game of run blocking um, out there on Sunday. So just continuing to see him improve and not only run and pass, um, but just that the mental side of the game, you're seeing fewer mental errors. You're seeing fewer mistakes with, with his eyes, like much more discipline. And as that confidence grows, it snowballs the performance. Um, and it's just so fun to see him out there, like just mauling people because he's such a big man and he does it with such joy on his face. Um, and knowing how hard he's worked at it, it makes me very, very pleased. Very pure joy. So they tried to throw a lot of things over there, and they were able to get on that play down near the goal line a free runner when they did a nickel blitz and overloaded on his side. But when he was one-on-one -on -one with Bosa, you mentioned the quality he's played. I, I think I'm right about this. 2021's Defensive Player of the Year was T.J. Watt. 2022's Defensive Player of the Year was Nick Bosa. You believe you have that so, right. So he's played two of them in his four starts mm -hmm. in his career, which is not very easy. Plus, he had Harold Landry, who was a pro bowler, 12 sacks. Sam Hubbard's a very good player. Um, it, he's done a remarkable job. What what stood out to me, Hoff, and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on this. One of the things you showed me when we were watching your tape against TJ Watt was how you would vary your set. Sometimes you'd get right up on him and lock him. Sometimes you'd back up and wait for him to come to you and then be able to set there. I thought he did a really good job of that yesterday against Nick Bosa and there were times where he just completely engulfed and neutralized him yeah that's one of the things I used to do against Joey now Joey and Nick are obviously different players um, but they kind of play similar styles and to be able to mix up your sets as a young player like that is not something that you usually see and he doesn't have a whole lot of film out there so I think Nick Bosa was probably a little bit surprised by some of that and when you're a big man like Thanos is just getting your hands on a, a defender, it's over. And you saw that time and time again where he just gets his hands on people and swallows them. Um, and as he does that, he's going to gain more confidence being able to change up the sets a little bit so that guys just can't always try to run around the edge on him, which really, as a big man like that, as long as he keeps his shoulders square, nobody's going to run through him. Nobody's going to beat him inside with your shoulders square, so they're all going to try to run around him. So when your guy that you're going against is one-dimensional and you've narrowed it down to he's only going to do one thing, now you can focus all your effort on getting back as fast as you possibly can, getting those long arms out, and snatching them up. And so I think he's been playing really super smart football, and it's just really fun to watch that evolution. Yeah, the only sack that Bosa had came on a play where they blitzed the nickel off of Thanos' side, and Thanos went and got the nickel. He thought Wyatt Teller was going to slide over, and Hoff would probably know right off. My guess is they were showing five down, so my guess is he should have been on stayed inside and let the running back pick up the blitzer, and so maybe that was the sack there. But he certainly was not beaten. Nick Bosa was not touched on the play. Yeah, so I saw that one too, and I, I was wondering what the miscommunication there was because it looked like Thanos thought – 
that his right guard was coming, was with coming him. over. Because yep. that's the only reason that you would pass off Nick Bosa and go to a wider rusher. So either he was confused on what the protection was, or maybe there was some miscommunication when they were trying to change the, the point of where they were going to go. But obviously you don't want to leave Nick Bosa to get have the running back block him to go slide out to a little guy on the edge. Um, but, I mean, those are the type of things that happen sometimes. And thankfully, after a win, you, uh, when nobody got hurt on the play, you can pat yourself on the back and say, hey, you know, it's part of being a rookie. It's part of learning in the NFL. But um, really, outside of that one, I, I didn't see any obvious plays where I, I thought he got beat or thought that he had any big mental errors. And overall, I mean, he just looked smooth and steady, and, and it was beautiful. And that's what I mean. Like, he he did not get beat right there. That may have been a mental no. error on his part. But right. when Nick Bosa tried to rush on him, he had nothing, no success whatsoever. He did not give up a pressure. Crazy. This is the one pressure that he's being credited with at Pro Football Focus. They say he gave up this pressure in the, the sack. The Bosa on the sack. On that the was sack. It. Yeah. When he didn't touch him. With, yeah. When he – blocked who when he, he was, was engaged above. zero not a pressure crazy crazy i mean it it he showed that talent at ohio state but the idea that he would be able to do this right away there just was no if he were a first round pick <coughs> you would be saying we hit the lottery yeah and he's a fourth round pick yeah yeah so it, it really feels that way Hoff, just big picture with the offense too it, it we we talked about obviously duan quite a bit but an ability to run the ball, 34 for 160, uh, three chunk plays. Jerome had a chunk play. Kareem had the unbelievable play on the um, on the fake fourth down on the on the little toss sweep there. And then Goodwin had a 20-yard run as well. Uh, all told, 34 for 164.7. When you are trying to go with your third quarterback in five games, it sure helps if you can run it that way. What did you see better this week now that we're a couple of weeks without having Nick Chubb than what we'd maybe seen in previous weeks? Against a far better team, by the way. Yeah, I think the biggest thing when I'm watching Jerome Ford is he's just getting more comfortable in the offense, in these schemes. And I think when you start showing comfortability with different concepts, then your offensive coordinator, he's starting to realize, okay, these are the things that my guy does well. This is what he sees well. This is when he's the most comfortable understanding how the flow of this play is going to go. Um, and so I think it's just building that confidence for our running backs and figuring out kind of what we do best and what he feels uh, the most comfortable running. And I think Jerome Ford, he's got tons of talent. So finding that balance between him and Kareem Hunt and then throwing in a couple of those gadget plays with uh, Marquise Goodwin or Elijah Moore, I, I think that's what running back by committee is going to have to look like once you lose Nick Chubb. And, and what, what stood out to me about some of that ground game is that we were running uh, some things that I don't see us run a ton of, or at least I can't remember us running a ton of it, but that Kyle runs a ton of, those kind of tosses yeah. to use that toss to get either a zone or sometimes they would even pull somebody out in front of it, but those tosses being kind of a catalyst to getting the edge as opposed to maybe the slower developing traditional outside zone. Do I, do I have that right, and what did you think of that? Z, you must be in my brain. That was a perfect transition because with Nick Chubb, everybody talked about the pin pull because that's kind of what he ran best, right? That, yep. He was just real patient. He was really good at kind of finding those seams and then he's so hard to tackle, right? So he could always find his way through and then he had the speed where once he burst through the first line, he was able to hit that home run. Um, and I talked about Jerome Ford after Nick Chubb got hurt as a track runner, like a railroad track runner. And that's what we talk about. Your true outside zone scheme uh, running backs are guys that they get on that railroad track. They see everybody running sideways. They're able to find where that crease is to put their outside foot in the ground. They get their shoulders facing towards the opponent's goal line, and they're able to cut up through the defense. And that's who Jerome Ford is. He reminds me a little bit uh, of Duke Johnson when I played with him mm -hmm. as far as his ability to kind of see that crack, understand that he's got to sell it with his shoulders and then stick his foot in the ground at the last minute to cut up when he finds that seam. Um, and it was really fun to see that they're featuring that more and more and that they're getting more comfortable running those plays because that's what I think they had the most success on. And to your point about why they toss that play, right? That's just an outside zone, but the way they run it and the way they toss the football is because they want to get those linebackers thinking the ball is going outside that initially the, the linebackers see the toss. They think maybe in their head, Oh, pin pull. I got to run all the way to the sideline. I got to be 
faster and over the top of any down blocks that happen. So you can get those guys running further and farther than they normally would if you just turned around and handed the football off. Um, and a lot of times the running backs like to toss better because they're able to start their track wider. They catch the football, but now their shoulders are already facing downhill towards the opponent's goal line so they can see the, the full field. When you get a handoff, your shoulders are facing a little bit more towards the sideline, and you have to run a little bit further to be able to get those guys to run over the top on defense before you can cut up. So I love that uh, that little change up, that little tweak that Kevin Stavansky has thrown in there to make Jerome more comfortable within that offense. Now, the only downside of the toss is you lose some of your boots and your play action because – you can't really fake it. Like when the linebackers see the yeah. ball flying in the air, it's not like they're worried that the the quarterback's running out the back end. So you can't only have that in your arsenal, but it's a great changeup and it's a, a great credit to Kevin Stefanski for understanding what Jerome Ford does well and then trying to feature it a little bit more. Yeah, and on those plays, both of them, we ran it twice in the second half at the end of the game. In fact, one for 13 yards uh, and one for, I think, about 12 yards. Uh, 14 and 13, I'm sorry, with Jerome Ford. And what they did is they brought Harrison Bryant in motion across the field, and he was kind of like the lead blocker, and they really tried to get Jed Wills outside with him, and then everybody else kind of ran like a zone. Everybody else did the move down the line to the left there. Maybe at some point you're going to give that same motion, you're going to probably fake that toss and then spin it out to the right, and it'll be just if you can, you're going to have to get that defensive end chasing down the field or else the quarterback's going to turn into a, a sandwich. But if he does, I think you'll have the defense flowing hard that way that was one of the fun concepts that kyle shanahan kind of stepped up the evolution of the zone schemes from where his dad mike had was starting to incorporate a lot of these tosses a lot of these misdirections because the next evolution right you talked about okay you got somebody that's coming in motion that now is in the backfield usually a tight end or a fullback and he's working in combination on the front side so yep. it makes as an offensive tackle, my job way better because now I know that even though my guard and center to the inside are working a defensive tackle combination to a linebacker off the ball, I am not by myself. So I can still take a really wide and fast first step without having to worry about getting beat inside because I know that there's now a fullback that's in the second level behind me that now if my man takes a hard inside move, I can leave him for the fullback who's going to probably chop him down and put him on the ground right there. And now I go up and we exchange blocks. So it gives you a way to the weak side to be able to still have a combination with your offensive tackle, which has the hardest block on that play because he's usually by himself by bringing somebody in motion and then having a combination that's working off the ball. So no matter what that defensive end does, he's going to be wrong because if he plays wide and plays with the tackle, the tackle takes him to the sideline because yep. he's running further and farther and faster. If he goes inside, now my fullback or my tight end comes in and cleans up the, the stuff. And then your second revolution is now you fake that toss and now you've got a, a fast guy like an Elijah Moore or Marquise Goodwin or somebody who's coming in motion in the opposite direction. So as you're faking that toss, now you do a little reverse handoff to him and now everybody's running left and you got your fast guy running right, running all the way around the defense. Joe, as you, I mean, you think about all the incarnations of this offense that we've had to do through the first five games, it's really pretty wild. When you think about having Nick Chubb to not, three different quarterbacks, now we're integrating this move that, that works very well for Jerome Ford's skill set. Provided Deshaun, well, Watson will come back eventually, whether it's this week or whenever. What what do you think this offense will, now that we're five games in with all these different amalgamations, what will this offense be at its best? Well, I hope we get to see it pretty soon because I think kind of that downfield passing is that next step, right? We ran the ball really well. We got efficient passing from P.J., and I thought he did a great job extending plays. Um, to me, that was a huge addition for the offense was having a quarterback that if it didn't look good, if it wasn't there, he was able to get out of the pocket and either run or get out of the pocket and make some throws. And I mean, if he was able to hit some of those throws when he was outside the pocket, yeah. I mean, it would have been a blowout. It wouldn't have had to come down to uh, a missed kick at the end because he missed a ton of throws that, you know, he was frustrated with himself that were guys were just wide open, scot free. Um, and so I think you, you hope that when you get Deshaun back, you get the same ability to run some of those zone reads, those RPOs, some of those scramble drill plays, but he's able to also hit them, those intermediate throws, but also some of those home runs down the field because we got a couple of burners, like with yep. Marquise Goodwin and, and Elijah Moore. Like when it becomes scramble drill, if I'm on defense, I'm scared. My tail's between my legs because those dudes are going to turn and run to the goal line and Deshaun has the arm to be able to hit them down the field. 
Yes, he does. And, yeah, there were a couple on that last drive where you're like, you don't get too oh. many where you got a guy with – I mean, Elijah Moore might have scored on that one if he got in the oh, way yeah, where there was, there was nobody for 30 yards nope. within him uh, around him there. I, I want to flip it back to the D real quick because there was a play that I noticed uh, in the first half of this game that I thought changed the way that the 49ers played offense and the way that Brock Purdy was able to play. And that was early in the game we ran a twist on a third down. Zadarius Smith – absolutely decked him it was a ball that was thrown down the field to Brandon Ayuk with Denzel in coverage and they were not able to connect Brock Purdy started I think he was five of seven at that point and he ended up 12 of 27 so that's seven of his last 20 I, I thought that was a big one when you when you saw that and saw the hit did you think that that was going to have a lingering impact I didn't you know it didn't look super nasty from where I was watching it um Maybe you had a better view on it, but uh, clearly it shook him because from that point on, he was dreadful. I think in the second half until his last drive, he only completed one pass. Yep. And, and I think some of that w was because, you know, McCaffrey goes out with the oblique, Debo Samuel's out. Um, so you didn't have all your weapons, but still, I mean, the guy had really played really great at quarterback up until that moment and was very accurate and very decisive with his decision making and you just didn't see that and I don't know how much the weather was affecting him you saw the ball just not come out really clean a number of times but I think more than anything it was just the Browns defense and the way that they were hitting him the way they were, they were getting to him it really seemed like he was rattled probably for the first time in his entire career all right gentlemen let's do some game balls let's start with the Hoff on offense who gets your game ball my friend I got to give it to P.J. Walker, right? He's not here for very long. He comes in. He plays admirably. He missed a few throws, but I thought he was cool, calm, under pressure. He did exactly what you needed to win. He gave you a dynamic threat at quarterback that a lot of guys aren't going to give you. And I think he put pressure on what was the, probably the first or second best defense in the NFL. And to be able to come out of there with a win, good on you, man. Pure joy. I'm going to go with Amari Cooper. Four catches, 108 yards. His 58-yarder leads to the first mm -hmm. touchdown. His one on third down leads to a field goal. He made just every time he touched the ball, it was a massive, massive play. He had the slant on the last drive as well that helped get the Browns down now there for the game-winning field goal. I thought Amari Cooper was sensational. Um, you can make the case, honestly, Big Thanos should get the game ball uh, as well, but I'm going to go with Amari Cooper. Four catches, 108 yards, 27. And you think about the fact that you know, P.J. Walker completed 18 for 192. Amari had four for 108. So that means his other 15 completions went for 84 yards. Yeah, that, that's got to get better. Well, that's got to get <laughs> a lot other better. Side. Yes. Jerome Ford was awesome in this game, especially on late in the game when you needed it. Had some very, very big runs. And Dewan Jones was spectacular as well. On defense, Hoff, who gets your game ball? I'm going to go with Rodney McLeod. I thought he was great. He – came up on a number of different blitzes you saw him in the backfield he had uh, eight tackles seven of them solos one tfl and i think he was a big part of the way that he was able to disrupt the 49ers offense and make brock purdy question a lot of those things i mentioned earlier the thing that brock purdy has done the best is that decision making which is the hardest thing to grade coming out of college right? you have no idea what they're being taught where they're supposed to throw the football the level of competition uh, and a lot of times that's what makes a trey lance versus a brock purdy um, and I thought that the job that the secondary did with, with Rodney was exquisite to be able to confuse uh, Brock Purdy and to make him unsure about where he was throwing the ball, made him hold on to it a little bit longer, and it led to only a 40 quarterback rating coming out of that game for Purdy, who had never lost a regular season game in his NFL career. Yeah, well, he has now. A lot of streaks were broken on that day. Joe Montana, I wonder if he popped a bottle of champagne for their 15-game <laughs> winning streak. Still standing as the 49ers record. I'm he was in South Bend. Was he? On, so well, on Saturday night. Felt yeah. like a rousing. Yeah. He inspired a great performance. He, did. he really did, yeah. yeah. Inspirational. Uh, I'm going to go MJ Emerson, getting his first pick of his career, you know, getting the first pick off of Purdy this year, and the fact that you kind of needed – you know, that play now did not necessarily lead to what we wanted from an offensive performance. And we need to do a better job of capitalizing on those takeaways when we do get them. But I thought it was great to see MJ Emerson there. And I'll give honorable mention to my guy, Zadarius. He does not have a sack yet, which has to be probably very hard for him. But I'm going to do some research. I don't know when last time he went five games without a sack. But he leads our team and he led our team pressures this game. He's always around the quarterback. He has been dominant in setting the edge in the run game. He's been 
phenomenal. I feel like there's going to be a game where he's going to end up with like three, like it's just going to come in bunches. It feels like while he doesn't have one, he's always around the quarterback and then somebody else does. Yes. So it's happening. Like it's a millisecond difference on, on all of that. Gentlemen, um, this was a fun win. It was a necessary win because what the AFC North looks like right now after week six, the Ravens atop at four and two. Us and the Steelers are both three and two and the Bengals have won two in a row. They are three and three. So as much as this is fun and it feels like a bonus win, you kind of almost had to have it, Hoff, when you think about how tough this division is and how good all of the teams are. Not a team under 500. Yeah, we thought maybe at the beginning of the season, AFC North would be the toughest division in football. And, you know, it was a rocky start mainly because Cincinnati didn't start the way you expected. But uh, the reversion of the mean is real. And this is going to be a, a bloodbath till the end. So this was a huge one to be able to keep pace. And I think more than anything, just kind of build some confidence that, Hey, we can win this. We got this great defense. We know the formula. Just don't turn the football over. We can run the ball still, even though Nick Chubb's not here anymore. And, you know, hopefully you build some optimism and enthusiasm for getting Deshaun back and hopefully taking that next step. Yeah, because it, you have an opportunity to stack a win here. To, and, and I think this next one coming up against Indianapolis, they lost 37 to 20, and it really wasn't that close. They were No, they, they were they slumped. Slumped. Slump City uh, with Gardner Minshew as their quarterback. Because getting to 4 and 2. I mean, nobody else – that would put you right where the Ravens were after six games. They got a tough one with Detroit this week. But I think you need to just continue to stack the wins because it feels like this team with where the defense is, and if you – you know, hopefully we'll get Deshaun Watson back this week. If not, certainly it would be soon thereafter that that snowball effect could really get going where this becomes a team that all of a sudden is going on the field expecting to win, and that kind of seems to manifest itself in, in the NFL when those things happen. Yeah, I think we send a thank you card to the 49ers for that fight before the game. Because, I mean, I'm sure the boys were fired up, but it just seems like sometimes little things like that is the spark that starts that snowball like you're talking about, where all of a sudden this team's feeling itself, you get such a huge win, and you, it brings you together as a team. Um, and so I, I think that was that was it was funny after that happened. I was like, Okay, this is going to be a game. This is not going to be the game that people think it's going to be. Uh, and so I love that little feistiness that we had in pregame. And that's kind of cool, man, picking a fight with the big bully in town and then whipping his ass. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and, and Greg Newsom said, like, they picked the fight with us. And then we said, oh, yeah, well, yeah, really? I mean, like, they used to, and that's what led to it, which was awesome. Hoff, the next step, though, I, I, if, this, if we are going to be a team of consequence, it is beating the teams you're supposed to beat. And you are supposed to beat Indy. Yes. You are absolutely supposed to beat Arizona. At Seattle will be a challenge. But but if, if we are going to be a team that tracks down and makes the postseason the AFC, it's time to look the part Sunday in Indy. I mean, this this is – whatever happened yesterday, it, it all goes away if you don't take care of your business on Sunday. That's right. And it's not just about squeaking out a win. It's about doing what you're supposed to in a commanding manner in a dominant fashion. And so I think that hopefully that's – the message that's the the rally cry all week it's not like hey let's go in there and sneak a win out because all wins are tough in the nfl but um i think to build on what you did this week you got to go in and, and, and take care of business and come out of there feeling like not only did we win we made he sent a message to the league and we got better in the phases that we needed to improve in all right hoff Huh? It's always better on a Victory Monday, my Time friend. Time flies when you're having fun. It really off. does. The Joe Thomas Glorious. Half Hour, Pure Joy Edition. We'll talk to you again next week, hopefully after another win, my friend. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. Go Browns. Hoff. All right. The Hoff. Uh, coming up next, we'll take a look around the league as well. And as we mentioned, this, this is a must-win situation. They did it, and now you got to do it again this week against Indy. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet. Sports betting partner, your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Seven Cleveland Browns Daily tomorrow live one to three Buffalo Wild Wings on Diamond Center Drive in Menor. Reggie Langhorn will join us to sign autographs from two to three. Visit the Cleveland Browns Facebook page to learn more. Is that the correct spelling? Do they go with the French Canadian spelling? Yes. Diamond Center. Yeah. C E N T R E. I like that. Yeah. How about that? That feels like a sophisticated location. Oh man, yeah, that's Minyana, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we got to talk all that through because I don't know how you guys are all going to make it there. <laughs> well, one of us is going to be a real challenge. Me too. Are you having to come from? I have to come here and shoot and then, X's and Joes. Yeah, your timing of that will be fun. Um, so maybe it'll be a, a Gibby and Uno production. A, Gibby and Uno. <laughs> Uno's ready. Uno's ready. He's, He's ready. He's ready. Giddy. He's we're, giddy. We're, we're shaping up for that. He's yeah. going to be fine. Uh, You're safe, We're, we're going to need to figure out some things, and I figure at about 2.55 we can talk through we're some of those logistics. Get there. through those logistics. Who's going to figure that out? Yeah. Um, time now for our great clips. It's going to be great clip of the game. This is the 49ers missed field goal from our Spanish broadcast and play-by-play voice, Rafa. Rafa. Fantastic. This was on La Mega Media. Have a listen. El saque vendrá en camino de 42 yardas. El intento para la victoria para Jake Moody. La patada con distancia. Y sin dirección, Jake Moody acaba de dejar el invicto en el terreno de juego. El reloj todavía dice seis segundos. La patada abierta por la derecha, wide right. Y los Browns de Cleveland van a ganar el encuentro 19 a 17. <laughs> hay veces que hay que tener suerte. Oh, oh my gosh! Right? We need that laugh. Yeah. Right? <laughs> isolated. That laugh is amazing, right there. What did that he say so at the good. end? What give me two it, seconds. Give me, give me the very, give me the laugh, and then what he says at the end. I thought I heard like a Dia de los Muerte, but uh, that wouldn't make any sense. Hay veces que hay que tener suerte. I don't know. So good. I don't know. I like it. You know, it's interesting is both that call and Andrews, who was really good um, on filling in for Chris, who's filling in for the the voice, of course. Um, But both you could because it seemed like such a lock that he's going to make it. Yeah, because, you know, this is what happens, right? All the hope and then it's all lost. And so you can feel like the formality of like, okay, lining up. And then it's like, and even our guys, like if you've seen the video of our guys, like I think it's Amari who's like, he missed it. Like, because you're the all bench, setting up hugging, for it. Pure like, like, well, yeah, who doesn't make a formality? During the game, and I've asked uh, Mr. McDaniel to pull some GoPro footage. Great. At one point, Zagura has his fingers on the desk and his eyes are at desk. He is almost under the desk. <laughs> He's beyond nervous. Siciliano is pounding on the roof of the booth. God, and I'm great. like, what is going on? We've lost all control here. Well, you should. I mean, it matters. It was, I mean, man. Zagura wanted to crawl into a fetal position if he could have. It matters. And well, then I was. I saw it with the boys. Like, so I, happy. I was watching this because I, I did. This was like Joe said, 10 percent. I about five for me. I mean, just knowing how good they were, um, knowing everything that was we were up against. And we were a, a 10 point, almost 11 point dog at one point going into the game. And it just didn't feel like one that was going to be a nice Sunday up on the lake. And so I, I had a bunch of work that I had to do around the house. So I had it. It was on the TVs, all the TVs, every room I was in. So I was paying attention to it. But I wasn't watching it as intently as I did, for example, the week before that I normally watch a Browns game. So I thought, you know what, this is not going to go well. And, and so I'll be aware of what's going on. But the boys were locked in and they're screaming in the basement, I was watching upstairs as because by the time you get the fourth quarter, you're like, well, you got a puncher's chance here now. Oh, yeah, now we're now, in now, now we're in this thing. So I'm dialed in at that point. Like, they never lost hope. It's like the innocence of youth. It's beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, they were bouncing around like maniacs yesterday I with mean, it. So. That, that, that was our fan base. I love that they were I, in. I kept watching, and we're doing the game, and I'm like, the longer this stays this way, well, yeah. like, it when, just kept getting louder When did you guys allow for – I mean, look, like we're human, and you know the opposition. When did you allow for, oh, we're, we, oh, we can go? 10-7 we we, at the half, and 10, we were seven. getting the ball back. And I was like, our defense is clearly settled in after that opening drive. We're good. We showed a little, some signs of life. Mm-hmm. And I felt like it, we, it was going to be – I feel great confidence in our kicker. I know he did miss one barely, but he still knocked in four um, in the game. And I thought, we had a, I thought we had a chance because I thought that the longer it went – the more the pressure shifted the Niners. And they started the second half like three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out. I mean, 
it was so i was like okay it kind of got it kind of got to that feeling where in the uh the steelers game when you're kind of like just don't mess it up of course we then throw the pick and i'm like oh no like that's that feels like that could be tough but so the Niners take the opening. They never got any points out of that, though, did they? The, uh, no. uh, yeah, the second pick they did. The, sec- the first one, though. The first no, one, no. no. I would be at the yeah. second one. No, the second one. The second one, yeah, one yeah. and I'm it's like, like oh, and now we we're, yeah. well, because we were ahead 13-10, and then all yeah. of a sudden we're buying 17-13, really in the blink of an eye. Uh, the Niners' possessions in the first quarter, they went 84 yards for a touchdown. Then they get the interception. We send them back 10 yards. They miss the field goal. Yeah. Then it's a three and out. Then they had 11 play, 71 yard drive. They got a field goal that made it 10 nothing uh, with 7.50 to go in the second quarter. Then they had nothing. End of the half. Interception. Three and out. Three and out. Three and out. The touchdown after on a one play drive. Three and out. I mean, they had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 drives. They only had gained a single solitary first down on five of their 13 drives. Like, so I felt going into it, you could kind of get a sense kind of going through that end of that second half that, or the first half in the second quarter, we got the touchdown. They weren't able to answer that. And then you went three and out, three and out, you got the pick, all that. I was like, okay, we're, it feels like we've kind of got their number uh, in, in this one. I thought it was impressive. And I know we've talked about our kicker. You mentioned, yeah. you mentioned him missing one, but you could tell right away, like, on the next one, he was adjusting. First time really with that wind and yeah, the right. weather not being great. And I, I know the Bengal game was rainy, but it wasn't super windy per se. Like the wind s- switched during the game. Yeah. Um, and you could just – the adjustments he made, like that was – well, he it's hits all it the pure. In the world He's a ball striker. I he mean, sure he, is. He yeah. hits, we, we heard like, you know, people talk about A ball. But he hits his A ball, feels like pretty much all the time. And the only misses he's had have both been 40 yards, both going that direction on a field from where we stand. Um, and both were lined on the right hash, and he hits that little draw, and neither one started out right enough, and he just missed them left. From the left hash, though, it's like you can tell it just suits his eye. It's just hit it right inside the right upright, and it ends up mm-hmm. right in the middle. Yeah, the um, there was a, a moment in the third quarter where you were going through those series of things, and Kyle was so frustrated by what wasn't happening offensively, that there was a penalty on us, and they couldn't find him to determine whether they were going to accept the penalty. I or know not. exactly where you were at because we were like, "What's the delay?" And I'm like, "They couldn't oh, find him." Kyle was down at the 20 yard line. No. He has his hood up. He's at the he's other so pissed 20. off. Yeah. Like his face was so pissed off, so angry that he's down talking with the offense. Yep. They couldn't even find him to decide if he was going to accept the penalty or not. Guys. So at that point, you said this is a this guy is one of the true geniuses in the sport when it comes to play yeah. calling. He is flustered. His offense has been absolutely stymied. I'm going to give you a stat that I think is going to maybe blow your mind. They yeah, had point. five drives out of 13 that gained a yard or more net for the whole drive. They had five drives out of 13 that went negative yards. And then they had three drives that went exactly zero yards. Thir- oh, jeez. I mean, eight of their 13 drives. Now, one of them you could really cross that off. I used it to make it more fun, but it was sure. they knelt at the end of the first half one yard, yeah, one yeah, play with negative yeah. one. So it's called 12. Yeah. They still had five drives with a positive yard, four drives that would be negative, and three drives with zero. So seven out of their 12 drives produced zero yards. This isn't like... We get eight yards, and then we punt. And one of the drives that counted for having good yards, they did only go eight yards. Now they only needed eight yards, unfortunately. But that's ludicrous. Yeah, and on a team that was the most efficient offensive team They'd in the game. They scored 30 in. in a row in eight straight games. Yeah. They were – let's – oh. Oh, no. Sad. Is that a new board? No, it's an old one, but very sad. Oh uh, no! Very oh, sad. that's okay. It's all right. We got to preserve it. That's the I Niners I'm board. To, I know. It's very you sad. know, in a way, in a way, that might make it even more valuable. It's Do a, you like it's a paper towel? One because one. it, yeah, paper towel would be good. Oh no, paper towel. Let's get this one away. Because if all right, it so does, that you don't want to oh, no, no, lift it. You don't put it in the, it. the other one. Get it out of the wet. Dang you put it. it right in the wet. <laughs> no. Oh no! Oh no! A man who usually has all the answers is oh no! There it is. Start wiping. Oh no! They're both. 
The other one was fine. <laughs> the other one was perfect. What were you doing? I don't know. You couldn't. You, and I now you're running it through it where it doesn't need to be. I think it's got to go all down. I'm creating art now. Oh. Very oh sad. Oh, my gosh. The water I asked for. The water you asked for. No lid. Give it. Smart. Smart. Always. Smart. There are Smart. rules. Smart. Uno. Oh. Well, that puts a real damper on things. You know what? It does make the it priceless, a priceless. W- the, the priceless sheets have been damaged. <laughs> I don't know how we're ever going to do this again. I'm very sad about it, actually. <laughs> you should be. It's the Niners board. And I had one that was perfect. You had so a perfect it still could have been board. fine. But the truth <laughs> did you, is. Did you see what he did? But I he put, dropped the perfect board right in the water. Where's the good one? Where's the other one, Uno? I, I'm laying it, it's laying down right but here. But I, I think that one I only smudged the back on. Yes, you got the back. You're not the, the front. The so, fr- so we're fine. We're fine. Let's see the back on this one because we'll put them in there. Eesh. Eesh. Yeah, there was a lot there. That was a direct hit. <sighs> you know Good what? Job, Victory Good Monday, job. pure joy. Don't care. Irregardless I'll say of the that, boards. I'll say that this board was damaged by the tears of Pedro. Tears of Pedro. Yeah. Yeah, that was victory for him. He And the funny thing was he had a real breakdown at the end of the show on Friday when you just left. Yeah, he called for the interception. He did get that right. Yeah, where he was, where he had a real breakdown of all uh, the various things. Uh, the, by the way, like – Last night, dinner, dinner, yeah, a little Thai food. B- yep. big dinner tonight. Big dinner, big tonight, dinner tonight. Going away yeah. dinner. Big, big going, yeah, away, going dinner. away dinner tonight. It's been a fantastic trip. By I'm just all mad accounts. if I can't. Congratulations read this on a four-year run. It's been a run. <laughs> it's just been Jeez. everything that you need. All right, we got. Hey, we got a score tonight. We do. It's a big we one score tonight. tonight. And yeah, we, it's, and it's kind of a fun Monday nighter. There's only there are only 15 games, right? Yes. yes. So we've already locked in a winning week. Another winning We're week. We're already yep. eight and six. Uh, we'll get you your scores coming up next. Listen to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland. Ah!
The Browns, avocados from Peru and Meyer want you to enter the ultimate football sweepstakes, your chance to win a 2023 Ford Lightning electric pickup truck, VIP tour of the Cross Country Mortgage Campus, or a $1,000 Meyer gift card. Today's the last day to register. Visit your local Meyer, clevelandbrowns.com slash avocados for more information. We have Monday night football tonight. No Mannings, though, right? No, no Mannings. Mannings. That sucks. That's fine. It would have, The main cast would have gotten ruined for me. I'd rather have that in a pure Monday coming up. Yeah. Uh, can I interest you, though, in the Dallas Cowboys visiting SoFi Stadium in the Los Angeles Chargers? One minute, Chargers, one minute. winners of two in a row, two and two. Cowboys coming off that Monday or Sunday night debacle against yeah. the Niners. Bishop. So, Eckler back, uh, Bosa back, James back. I mean, just don't screw it up, Staley. Well, that's We're going to his neck of the to. woods tomorrow. I think even if he screws it up, it's to lose by one. I mean, there's just – I just – come on. Handle your business. Handle your business. I'm with you. are the better team. Chargers. Chargers uh, 38-34. Same. Got to be, right? Got to be. Come on. You're the better team. So, we're looking at either getting up to – if we win this one, a nine and a sixer, yep. which would put us at 29 over 500 each, a loss. Mm. Eh, still 27 over 500. No I biggie. to see it. Yeah. Going to be a fun one to continue talking about this one as the week goes along and then as we start to prepare for Indy, but it's always better on a Victory Monday edition. The next level is coming up next. Thanks for listening, everybody. Cleveland Browns Daily, 850 ESPN Cleveland.